Thank you, God. Y'all can have a seat. Welcome to Concord. We are so glad that each and every one of you are here. I mean, truly, I need you to understand that I am grateful that you have chosen to prioritize being here to worship together today. You know, I think it's important that we understand that coming to church and checking a box is is one thing, but gathering together to worship, to pray, to study God's word, it is vital to you and I, am I right? I mean, it is so important. Scripture actually encourages us to not neglect meeting together. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 says this, and let us consider, let us consider, let us think about how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another as we see the day drawing near. And so I just want to encourage you today. I am thankful that you and your friends and your family are here to study the word of God together. I also want to say good morning to our family over at Concord Mount Yona. We are so excited that you're here. Pastor Joseph has been telling me all that you guys are doing to really reach and minister to your community, how you are finding creative ways and intentional ways to serve the city of Cleveland. And I just want to say, we are so proud of you. Want to say good morning also to our Dahlonega campus. Man, it is incredible what Eli and Pastor Joel are telling me, the life change that we're seeing. Now, did you guys know they have had eight baptisms in eight weeks over at our Dahlonega campus? And man, the God is moving. And I just want to say, well done. Thank you for holding Jesus high, his gospel true. It is going to be amazing. Now, I got to tell you some some crazy news. Christmas is six weeks away. Now, for some of you, joy rose up, and all of a sudden, ornaments just burst out of your heart, right? Right? And some of you, you need some anxiety medicine right now, right? You're starting to freak out like Christmas is just around the corner. It is one of those things that comes so crazy. Now, I know that there are two groups in this room. There are some of you who put up your Christmas tree in December, and then there are the rest of you who are wrong, all right? I, 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 I mean, I'm serious. I mean, we went to a, a church member's house the other night. They invited us over for dinner. As a matter of fact, we kind of invited ourselves. But we showed up, and they had their Christmas tree up. I literally had to pray if I was going in or not. I, I literally struggled with the doctrine, like, we're called to be a people of thanksgiving. All right? We're called to give thanks. And, and Christmas happens in December. But listen, as we talk about Christmas, this is one thing that we're starting to find out and know to be true. It's not just something we've experienced, but something that data is showing us that people are more open to an invitation to come with you during the holidays. They're not more open to go somewhere that you tell them, but to come alongside of you because the hustle and bustle of the holidays, the hardness, the change, the missing pieces, the folks that were there that weren't there, the pressure of school and work and all of the things, and they are looking for longing for meaningful relationships which means they are ready to have you invest in their lives, people that you've been spending time with. So this is what I'm asking you of your pastor as your pastor start out this morning, all right? I need y'all to write it down or type it, type it in your phone. I wanna ask you to do something today. When you leave here today, I want you to do something for me. I want you to create with your family, with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, with your roommates, whoever it is, I want you to create a list of people that are in your sphere of influence. 
That can be other families, maybe that you're at the ball fields with or in the gym with or your kids hang out together or live down the street and make a list of friends that you know maybe walking through some hard times that have, have struggling with things with their job or with their family or somebody that has passed away, maybe students, your classmates, people that you play sports with or do music with or, or whatever that is, that you would create a list of people in your sphere of influence that you can begin to pray for as a family and friend group. I want to ask you to do that. If we know that people are open to an invitation, why would we as the church not make a list and say, God, would you move in the lives of these people? Because this is what I know. Living in North Georgia for a little over two years right now, a lot of people are affiliated with a church, but that does not mean they walk with Jesus. It means that they know how to do the Christmas stuff but they may not know the Christ of Christmas. And we know when they're open, we need to get into the business of investing in those around us. We've got a couple of more weeks of this Battleground series. And then coming back from Thanksgiving, we're spending the whole service doing the Lord's Supper, walking through the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together. And then we start December 3rd, our Christmas series called Christmas Convos. And we're gonna look at the conversations that happened around the birth of Christ. It's crazy interesting. And then on December 24th, it's actually a Sunday. We're going to have our candlelight services on Christmas Eve that day. This is a chance for you to bring people alongside of you, invest in people, and not just figure out what you're going to have for Christmas dinner. It is a chance for us to be missional in the Christmas season. So this day, this very day, when you go home, would you all do this? Would you create a list would you pray over that list? And then would you begin to be bringers and starting conversations with people? What have you got to lose? Amen? There are people that desperately need Jesus all around us. Well, each week we try to come in here and spend time in the word of God. We believe here at Concord that this is the truth of God, uh, the, the, that this is the truth, that it is inerrant, it's infallible, that, that this is the very breath of God, and we go to Scripture as our God. And I want each week that you come in here, that you're taking notes, that you're digesting, that you're walking through this, and that you are growing and maturing in Christ. And we're in week three of this series that we're calling Battleground. Battleground is this series that it's really kind of taking on some of the ideologies of our culture, things that are very sneaky in our lives, things that we begin to believe, lies that we begin to adopt that come very quietly and sneakily around our lives. And then when we confront them, we begin to think, man, I can't ask about this inner struggle. I can't ask about this confusion because I should be further along and I should know the answers to this. You ever felt that way before? You get to a place where you're struggling with something, you're like, but I should be beyond this right now. I can't ask for help. So what we're doing is we're just laying it out here and filleting it as we go through scripture. And today's battleground that I believe is very sneaky and probably the most dangerous one of all the ones we're talking about is a cultural agenda that says... Follow your heart. That you are to follow your heart. You're to be true to yourself. That maybe in this generation it's been rebranded as you do you. That we become the center of all things that go forward. That we trust ourselves. We trust our feelings and our emotions. This heart, the, the decisions that we make. And some of you are going, oh, pastor, I'm past that. I've never let that into my life. Have you ever seen a Disney movie? I mean, I'm telling you, everything is just follow your heart. Just go, get out there. Make sure that, that you get what you need. Trust in this moment. Trust in these feelings. But before you put up your fences or defenses, I gotta tell you this, just right off the bat. Following your heart or following your feelings, that's just bad advice. It's bad advice through and through. I mean, really bad. I mean, when someone tells you, hey, you just do you, put your feelings and emotions over anything else, you're, you're thinking, man, I would never fall to that. I got to tell you, I bet we've all fallen to it at one point or another, have we not? 
that we've let how we feel, how we process, what we experience, and we have set that over reason, we've set that over truth, and we have gone in a relationship or out of a relationship or taken an opportunity or not taken based on how we feel, just following our heart in the moment. And so today, I wanna charge into this battleground and I wanna equip you with some things from scripture to help you as maybe this is slid into your life undetected and you become the authority of your life instead of the Lord. If you got a copy of God's word with you, I want you to turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 17. If you're new to scripture, open your Bible to the middle. It's in your Old Testament. You'll go a little bit to the right. There's a couple of big books in there. Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 17. If you've got your Bible out, just start at Genesis and scroll down until you see Jeremiah. Now, today, I got to be honest, we are going to be all over Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, back to Old Testament. We're going to go very fast. Just at least get it down if you can't turn there and you can go back and study this week. I want to invite you to take three notes with me today as we look starting in Jeremiah chapter 17. And our first note is simply this, your heart is bad and you need a new one. Your heart is bad and you need a new one. As we begin to look at this, I I begin to say, man, we really need to address the theology of this battleground, that we need to make sure that we've got our words right, our understanding right, because sometimes in English, we can take words that mean one thing, and then they mean something else to someone else. And so I want to address the theology because Jeremiah 17, 9 could probably have gone in our out of context series. The, the verses that are pulled out of their context, that are ripped from that context and then pressed into our culture to mean something else. Because most of the time that you and I have heard Jeremiah 17, 9 preached, it's been preached to born again believers. It's been preached to those who who have been made new in Christ. And I would say I lean towards that being a misapplication of this passage. Jeremiah chapter 17 is written to the nation of Judah. And just before Jeremiah 17, 9, there is an understanding that says, cursed is the man who trusts in himself. That there's a curse when you trust in yourself. That's a bad way to go. But blessed is the man who trusts in God. There's this dichotomy. You trust in yourself, there's curse. You trust in God, there is blessing, which makes you think, why in the world would anyone trust themselves over the creator of the universe? And he goes into Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, and it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it. And here when we see this, the heart, that's the metaphor for the, the mind and will, the emotions, that, that part of you that, that, that is, is making the decisions. And it says here that the heart is deceitful. It's a straight up liar. I mean, Yona, you listening to me on that? Your heart is a liar. The heart of man, the, the, the sin heart The one made of flesh, it will deceive you. It will trick you. Listen, it'll betray you. It will manipulate you. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? I want to be very clear. Usually we wait to the end of the service for this, but I want to tell you, if you're in this room today or you're at one of our campuses and you don't know Jesus... You have not been born again. You have not repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus. Here's what you need to know. We have all been born with a bad heart, a heart that is wicked and sick. And so when someone says to you, follow your heart, you just just do you, you ought to be thinking, are you trying to get me killed? Like my heart is bad news unregenerate hearts make bad decisions. And when we have a bad heart, we know that we need a new one. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to the right, to the book of Ezekiel. It's a couple of, uh, it's a book or so over. Ezekiel chapter 36. Crazy enough, this is where my, Clint, my personal uh, 
reading plan is going through right now. My time alone with the Lord is through the book of Ezekiel. And y'all, this is tough stuff. It is deep water. Man, I am struggling through this book. I mean, but if you go to Ezekiel chapter 18, it will change the way you view the gospel. Like it is powerful. Ezekiel 18, man, it is, it's crazy. But I got to tell you this, it is one of these things that as we're going through this book and I'm studying through this book, it's been on my heart. I think it was a week or two ago. It all runs together. I think it was last week, but I said, man, I, I think that God may be leading us towards reading through scripture together. Some kind Kind of reading plan that the whole church going through a part of scripture so we can we can read together we can ask questions together we can fall behind together we can catch back up together but that we can go through this together and so man i'm trying to think god where are you leading us if you have any spiritual insight the lord tells you come and find me all right let's talk that's a total side note but ezekiel chapter 36 it's a theologically interesting passage because it's going to introduce the, the Lord's work of the new covenant, very comparable to Jeremiah chapter 31. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, he says this, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Delonica, did you hear that? Because the Lord will give you a new heart. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I love this. You and I are born with a bad heart, one that is deceitful, but God can give us a new heart this comes in the new covenant that would be initiated with the death of Christ hundreds of years later. The spirit would come within us and cause us to walk according to God's statutes and obey his rules. Now, I wanna be clear with you because some of this is getting a little muddy for some of us. And I don't wanna allow for any confusion here this morning. The human heart is deceitful and sick. It's bad news. It's a bad heart. But when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they are given a new heart. And the Spirit of God allows them to walk in obedience to God's way. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, maybe you just come to church, maybe you try to be a moral or good person, I got to tell you, your heart is bad and you need to trust in Jesus and be made new. But some of you are going, hey, pastor, I get it, man. I, I, I hear you, but I've been made new in Christ. I have a new heart. I am saved. I am sealed. The spirit of God is within me. How in the world does this battleground affect me? I'm so glad you asked. It totally leads into my, my second point here. It's a good question. If you are born again, you have to understand you are at war. A battle between the spirit and the flesh that we still live in. Here's the second note. Get battle ready. The fight is raging. You and I as believers, we need to get battle ready. The fight is raging. I, I have to tell you, being a Christian is hard. I mean, living in this world, we're strangers. We don't belong here. Our home is not here. It's hard, but as new creations, those that have submitted to the lordship of Christ, that does not mean that our flesh and feelings will not rise up against the spirit within us. It does not mean we will not be torn. And I want you to flip to the New Testament, keep going right, you, to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter five, it's in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, all right? Galatians chapter five. Paul is writing to the church at Galatia who is in a spiritual crisis right now. False teachers have got in there. Things are going crazy and Paul is writing to them. It says in verse 16, Galatians chapter five, verse 16, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In the Greek, this is an imperative to walk by the Spirit. It's a command to do this and keep on doing it. It is an active, not passive way to live. It says, if you 
will walk by the Spirit, what will happen? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Claremont, there is a, there's a battle going on here. Look in verse 17. It says this, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Church, can I tell you, the spirit and flesh are at odds with one another. The spirit wants to lead you in obedience to Christ, wants you to mature uh, in your walk with Christ. The flesh wants to tear you down, lead you away from the Lord. These are opposed to one another, verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, You are not under the law. What a perspective of hope. But there are now sides he's going to talk about. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. That means they're obvious. Everybody can see them. The works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. He says this, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. And you're saying, Pastor Clint, we don't have idols in this culture. We don't worship little statues of wood or stone or gold. Yeah, but we do worship idols. We'll worship a football record. We'll worship a full 401k. We'll worship our kids' accolades. We'll worship how we look. We will set idols in our life. Sorcery, enmity. Check this out. Strife. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, and division. Some of you are like, I know people like this. Like they are bent on division. They are causing strife. They are working the crowd. They are angry all the time. You know these people? You look at them and there's just anger seething from them. Furrowed brows, frown on their face, arms crossed, not having it. It's wild, right? He goes on and says, envy drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He's not saying this is an exhaustive list, but these works are evident. He says, and I warn you, as I warned you before, that those, watch this, so sobering, who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, do in the Greek is a present participle, which it means makes a habit of doing these things. He says, those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what the flesh is set on, following your heart, following, that's what, the, the, that flesh side of things. You do you, you do what feels right, trust yourself. But then he shows the opposite. Look back at Galatians 5, chapter, or, uh, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And joy. You ever met somebody who really loves Jesus and you can just see the joy coming out of them? I mean, you look in their eyes and it's bright and you're like, yes. Like they love them some Jesus. They get it. They are filled with joy. Peace. And in the world we live in, it's crazy, is it not? And the people that are born into to that strife and they lean into that, but those who are in Christ and the, the fruit of the Spirit by God through us, patience kindness. Y'all, we're working with our kids right now. Tell them kindness costs you nothing, right? It's not expensive. You can be kind and it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. That fruit of the spirit, that you can be kind to people even when they're not kind to you. But that's a fruit of the spirit, goodness and faithfulness, a, a gentleness and self-control. A believer will be disciplined They will be disciplined in what they allow. It says, against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified. They've killed the flesh with its passions and its desires. Church, we gotta realize, even with a new heart, there is a battle, there is a war. The flesh and spirit are set opposed, and the flesh has evident works, and the spirit has fruit that is born. There is a way to see and tell. But we struggle in that war, do we not? It makes me think of a hymn I grew up on. 
uh, in church, and I pulled this from my office. I have several of these old hymnals. It's actually marked with my church that I grew up in, Bethany Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. And it reminds me of this old hymn. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. It's called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Y'all remember that one? And you never get to sing in a hymn all the stanzas, right? The music leader gets up there, one, three, five, and half a four, right? I don't know what that is. I don't know why we can't go in order. But in verse three here, there is these lyrics that I want to read to you that just make me think of this struggle. And it says this, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for, the, for thy courts above. I mean, do you feel the emotion of that? God, you've changed me. But God, I know in my flesh, I am pulled. I am prone to wander, prone to go my own way. He's literally saying, God, here's my heart. There is a pull, there is a battle that we have to submit completely to the spirit of God to crucify the flesh. And so Concord, what I wanna do is to equip you for battle. I wanna get very practical with you today because I think this follow your heart thing is very invasive, and we may not even know it, but I want to give you some, some tools to, to walk through this. And so this is our third and final note, and it is this, that we are to trust the Lord and to guard our heart. We're to trust the Lord and guard our heart. This is how we can step up as disciples, to actively pursue him, to understand that our, that our interaction with the Lord is not transactional, but relational. I mean, I grew up in an era of student ministry that it was like, hey, get your get out of hell free card. Like, walk this aisle, fill out this card, do this, and you're good. Live however you want to live. You've got it covered. It's a transaction. I believe there is a submission to the Lordship of Christ, that it is relational. So I want you to turn back to one final book with me in your Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. If you go back to the middle of your Bible, you'll hit Psalms. That's the book next to it, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter three. Verses five and six, they're very famous verses. You may have heard them, you may have not. Maybe it's your life verse. I don't know, but it's a powerful, powerful passage. Proverbs chapter three, verse five says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Who are we supposed to trust in? Who are we supposed to trust in? with all of your heart, without exception, and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse six, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. If you look at verse five, that first word is trust. I love this because in the Hebrew, that word trust means to lay on or to lie on. Isn't that crazy to think about? Trust means to like lay down. It's to put all of your weight on something, having faith that it will hold you like a bed. Think of it like this. Man, you tear off into your Monday tomorrow. And man, you've got everything planned. The kids are packed up. They're ready to go. You're getting them to school. You've got your meetings scheduled, your lunch going. And by the time you get to the office, everything has changed. It is the worst day possible. The, the people you were counting on to come through didn't show up for work today. The project was supposed to be there. Emergency is hit. The internet is down. It's crazy. You get a call from the nurse. Your kid's throwing up on everybody else. You got to go pick them up, take them home, drop them off with grandma. You go back to work. Your afternoon has gone crazy. You've got emails a mile long. You pick the kids up from school. You take them to practice. The coach is late. He doesn't show up. You're there with a bunch of kids. They're like, we got to practice. We're only in the gym for 45 minutes. You finally get them home. You get them fed with some McDonald's, put in bed, and you stand there going, what happened? And you just fall back on your bed without a care in the world thinking it's going to collapse underneath you, that you are trusting that in your sheer exhaustion, when you lie down, and you kick your feet up, that that bed is gonna hold you. This is the smallest analogy we can make 
to what it's like to trust the Lord with all of our heart, in all of our ways, without exception, we are trusting the Lord. And when we trust the Lord instead of our own insight and feelings, it makes me think of this illustration that I've seen before. It's an illustration that, that, that's pretty powerful, and I've seen it done in different ways, and I want to share it with you today. And it's, it's literally the illustration of the train cars. And you may be able to see this train up here today. Thank you, Stan, for helping me with it. But uh, you've got three parts. You've got the engine. Now, the engine is designed to to move it along, to be the power source, to lead it down the tracks. And following the engine is the coal cars, the thing that, that follows closely behind, and then it is finished up at the end with a caboose. It's the very last part of the train. It's the very ending of it. And when we look at this train, uh, we can see our life, that the engine for our train has to be the truth. It's our theology of God. It's the things that we know to be true that that we see in Scripture. It's the truth that leads our life. And this middle car is, is our obedience to it. It is how we follow the truth. When we know something is truth, how you and I respond and are obedient. Truth and obedience. And then following at the very end is our feelings and emotions. Our feelings and emotions that truth sets how we live and we obey it and then it informs how we feel. Truth, obedience, and feelings. This is the way the train should work. But we live in a culture that fights against this way. We live in a culture that says, follow your heart. Trust yourself. You do you. And in essence, what that does is it takes truth and our feelings and switches them. And all of a sudden, our feelings and emotions begin to be what drives our life. It begins to to be the, the thing that's pulling us in a direction. And our feelings then begin to inform our obedience. And this then begins to define our truth. See, when it's backwards like this and we let our feelings then inform what is true, we are in a bad place. See, here's what I need you to understand is we have to intentionally let truth guide our lives and let our emotions follow. See, feelings are meant to follow, not to lead. John Piper once said that emotions are a gauge, not a guide. They are a gauge, not a guide. It doesn't mean that your feelings and emotional and emotions are bad. It just means they have their proper place behind our truth and obedience. And this is how it plays out for a lot of us. We say things like, well, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like forgiving that person who wounded me. I don't feel like this or I don't feel like that. You know what? I believe sometimes it doesn't matter how you feel. Sometimes it just matters what's true. And we are then obedient to the truth and our emotions follow. Now, some of you, you can poke holes in this train thing. Listen, it's an illustration. But it's to say that truth should lead, not follow. That's what I see when it says trust in the Lord. With all of your heart and in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Go one chapter over to Proverbs 4. It's our final passage. This is an incredible passage. It's uh, the seventh of 10 in the book of Proverbs, uh, paternal coaching lessons, a father to his son. And then he says this in Proverbs 4, Verse 20, my son, be attentive to my words and incline your ear to my sayings. I love this, be attentive. It's the dad snap and clap. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where your kid's like, hey, right here. You're getting their attention, right? Like, hey, look right here. 
He's saying, listen to me, son. Be attentive. This is important. You're going to have some wisdom shed here. Uh, verse 21, let them not escape your, uh, from your sight, but keep them within your heart. Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Verse 23, keep your heart. Some of your translations may say guard. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Keep your heart, guard your heart in Hebrew. It's a command, it's a military term. Do this, your heart, that mind, that will, that emotions. You're to guard it with all vigilance. You may say, well, how do I do that? How do I split this thing of, hey, I've got a bad heart. When I meet Christ, I've got a new heart. Okay, now my, my, my spirit and my flesh are at war and now I'm being asked to, to guard my heart. How does all this work out? Well, let me give you three practical things for you to take with you. I wanna give you three ways to help you guard your heart starting today. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are just things that you can do today. The first one is this. Have a steady diet of scripture and prayer. Have a steady diet of scripture and prayer. And you're like, come on, pastor. This is the same old advice you give us all the time. Well, I will say this. I think many of us try to live a victorious Christian life being malnourished. We walk around fasting from the word of God. Maybe we come to church twice a month. We hear a 35 minute or if I'm preaching 50 minute message. And that's what we have to go on the entire week. We never open our Bibles. We never lock ourselves in the prayer closet. You're like, you understand how busy I am? Well, I will tell you this. We can get a steady diet of country music. We can get a steady diet of binging through Outer Banks. We can get a steady diet of college football, three, four, five football games in the week. And we just feed ourselves and feed ourselves and feed ourselves. And when it comes to God, we go a, a, a verse a day, he'll keep the devil away. He's saying, well, pastor, I already give 10 or 15 minutes to the Lord every day. What are you expecting me to do? Double it? Sure. Well, pastor, I already do 30 minutes. Would you suggest that I double it? Sure. Well, that's an hour a day. Yeah, of seven days of your 168 hours a week. Hey, listen, church, if we want to be victorious, we want to guard our hearts, we want to live and, and, and produce the fruit of the Spirit, we want to see God move in us, we need to have a steady diet of Scripture and prayer. The second thing is this, a surgical removal of all fle uh, fleshly influence. A surgical removal of fleshly influence. Hey, listen, some of us need to just cut some things out in our life. There are some, some, some friends there are some influences. There's some access to things on our phone. There are some, some things that just we need to be surgical about. You're saying, man, my, I need a whole new group of friends? Yeah. Well, we've been friends forever. So long, they're not helping. Hey, listen, we've got to get serious about our own heart. And there are people, you say, man, well, I, I, I got some friends and I struggle with alcohol, but they always want to go to the bar. Hey, what do you do? What do I do? You don't go. Get new friends. We've got to surgically remove some of these fleshly influences in our life. And number three, we need to set up consistent accountability. You know, here at our church, we value community. I got to tell you, community and accountability are two different things. Community is what we need around us. It's, it's when we sit in rows, we need people that we sit in circles with people that are gonna help us, people that are gonna support us, people that are gonna in, encourage us to walk in the Lord. But then there's a group of people that you are going to have to intentionally give permission to shine a spotlight in every part of your life that will call out the things that are not supposed to be there. You know, I've got my accountability group tonight. We sit around a table and we eat and we cut up, but we also study theology together. We're going through a Grudem book together. But then there comes a point where they ask me real questions. I've given them permission to say, hey, you can ask whatever you want about my life, about my marriage, about my parenting, about my ministry. Because if there is anything in me that would cause me not to be used, we need to address it, right? Right? And I'm just saying, leaving here today, these are three things that you can do very easily. Spending time with God. 
being cognizant and removing the things that keep pulling you towards the world and following your own heart instead of following Jesus. And three, giving people permission to be in your life. But I love this because very fatherly, he continues to fillet this for his son. And he says in verse 24, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. He says, watch your mouth. You know, Luke 6.45 says there's a link between your heart and your mouth. That what comes out of your mouth is an overflow of your heart. Bitterness, slander, gossip, foul language, dirty jokes, sarcasm. He says, you better guard your mouth. Verse 25, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Guard your eyes, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Be careful where you go. Concord, as we come up on this battleground, I can't help but think, what would the, our church look like if we abandoned the idea of following our own emotions or feelings? You just doing you. Trust yourself. Follow your heart. And we intentionally abandoned that and said, Jesus, I will follow you completely. Hey, listen, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. I don't want you ever to be deceived to think that it is not a complete submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You are his and his alone. But what if the people of Concord who had a broken and bad heart got a new heart? They got saved. What if the people of Concord battled their flesh and lived by the Spirit? What if the people of Concord trusted the Lord and guarded their heart with all vigilance? Can you imagine the revival that would come among us? When we were done with the ways of the world and we submitted fully to the Lord Jesus Christ, can you imagine what this place would look like? Can you imagine what your home would look like? Can you imagine what our community would say when they see hundreds of people saying, I'm done with leaning on my own understanding. I am fully submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the ripple effects that would have in our world? Oh, if we would submit to Jesus. And church, that's where it starts, with Jesus. That's where we started, Jesus. And I wanna tell you, if you don't know Jesus today, I wanna invite you to know him. But I wanna give a warning here to everyone who does know Jesus and doesn't know Jesus. I wanna make you very aware of a truth right now. There is an enemy and he hates you. He wants to tear your life down. But more than that, he wants you to miss moments like this. He wants to deceive you. He wants to distract you. He wants you to think, man, how much longer do we have? What's for lunch? What's going on? He's not talking to me. He's talking to somebody else. I know exactly what he's going to say. And we're missing a moment where we could be pressing into the Lord. So believers in the room, I want you praying right now. Pray for those who don't know Jesus in this room or at our campuses. Pray for, for those who are struggling with an addiction or a, a fleshly work that has grabbed a hold of their life, that God would remove that and give them strength to conquer it through the Spirit. And for you that don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you, come to Jesus today. So to keep from distraction, I want to call us all to prayer in this moment. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. Nobody leaving. We still got stuff to do. I'm telling you, lunch ain't that good. This moment's going to be better. If you don't know Jesus today, I want to tell you some truth. I want to tell you that God is good. He is perfect. He is the one true creator. He sits unopposed, holy on his throne. 
And that God, it's not you. You were created by God. You were formed by God in your mother's womb. He knows your fears and frustrations. He knows every hair on your head. He knows what excites you and what scares you. And he knows all of your sin. And you and I have sinned against God and our sin carries heavy consequences. The consequence of death and after death, separation from God. In God's great love for you, though, he sent his son, Jesus, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, being betrayed and beaten, and on the cross paying for your sin in his own blood. When he died, he was buried, and three days later, he conquered the grave. And if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, what scripture says is you will be saved. For you that don't know Jesus here today, would you exchange your bad heart for a new heart? Would you turn from your sin and turn to Christ today? Not to be better, not to be more moral, not to be more churchy, but to be brand new. Would you pray something like this? God, you're good, and I'm not. My sin has consequences, and I believe your son paid for them. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. And God, right now, in the best way that I know how, I ask that you would forgive me of my sin or that I would turn my back on my sin and you would forgive me and save me. God, would you save me now? If you prayed that prayer and you said, man, I have given my life to Jesus today, would you just raise your hand so I can see it? At all of our campuses, would you raise your hand? Okay, I see that. Anybody else? Hey, before you leave, would you tell somebody? Would you grab one of us? We'll have prayer partners up here, next step booth. Just something to say, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. We just want to encourage you to walk alongside of you. Don't leave here today without telling somebody. For the rest of us in the room, would you take this moment to pray? To turn from any sin that is in your life, any work of the flesh. Repent of that sin and say, God, would you allow me to trust you with all my heart? Would you give me strength to guard it so I may be used of you? Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for what you're doing, and God, I praise you, and I pray in the name of Jesus, amen and amen.